Wisdom is now so cheap and abundant that it floods over us from calendar pages, tea bags, bottle caps, and mass email messages forwarded by well-meaning friends. We are in a way like residents of Jorge Luis Borges' Library of Babel, an infinite library whose books contain every possible string of letters and, therefore, somewhere an explanation of why the library exists and how to use it. But Borges' librarians suspect that they will never find that book amid the miles of nonsense. Our prospects are better. Few of our potential sources of wisdom are nonsense, and many are entirely true. Yet, because our library is also effectively infinite, no one person can ever read more than a tiny fraction, we face the paradox of abundance. Quantity undermines the quality of our engagement. With such a vast and wonderful library spread out before us, we often skim books or read just the reviews. We might already have encountered the greatest idea, the insight that would have transformed us had we savored it, taken it to heart, and worked it into our lives. This is a book about ten great ideas. Each chapter is an attempt to savor one idea that has been discovered by several of the world's civilizations, to question it in light of what we now know from scientific research, and to extract from it the lessons that still apply to our modern lives. I am a social psychologist. I do experiments to try to figure out one corner of human social life, and my corner is morality and the moral emotions. I am also a teacher. I teach a large introductory psychology class at the University of Virginia, in which I try to explain the entire field of psychology in 24 lectures. I have to present a thousand research findings on everything from the structure of the retina to the workings of love, and then hope that my students will understand and remember it all. As I struggled with this challenge in my first year of teaching, I realized that several ideas kept recurring across lectures, and that often these ideas had been stated eloquently by past thinkers. To summarize the idea that our emotions, our reactions to events, and some mental illnesses are caused by the mental filters through which we look at the world, I could not say it any more concisely than Shakespeare. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I began to use such quotations to help my students remember the big ideas in psychology, and I began to wonder just how many such ideas there were. To find out, I read dozens of works of ancient wisdom, mostly from the world's three great zones of classical thought. India, for example, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the sayings of the Buddha. China, the Analects of Confucius, the Tao Te Ching, the writings of Meng Su, and other philosophers. And the cultures of the Mediterranean, the Old and New Testaments, the Greek and Roman philosophers, the Quran. I also read a variety of other works of philosophy and literature from the last 500 years. Every time I found a psychological claim, a statement about human nature or the workings of the mind or heart, I wrote it down. Whenever I found an idea expressed in several places and times, I considered it a possible great idea. But rather than mechanically listing the top 10 all-time most widespread psychological ideas of humankind, I decided that coherence was more important than frequency. I wanted to write about a set of ideas that would fit together, build upon each other, and tell a story about how human beings can find happiness and meaning in life. Helping people find happiness and meaning is precisely the goal of the new field of positive psychology, a field in which I have been active. So this book is in a way about the origins of positive psychology in ancient wisdom and the applications of positive psychology today. Most of the research I will cover was done by scientists who would not consider themselves positive psychologists. Nonetheless, I have drawn on ten ancient ideas and a great variety of modern research findings to tell the best story I can about the causes of human flourishing and the obstacles to well-being that we place in our own paths. The story begins with an account of how the human mind works. Not a full account, of course, just two ancient truths that must be understood before you can take advantage of modern psychology to improve your life. The first truth is the foundational idea of this book. The mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. Like a rider on the back of an elephant, the conscious, reasoning part of the mind has only limited control of what the elephant does. 
Nowadays, we know the causes of these divisions and a few ways to help the rider and the elephant work better as a team. The second idea is Shakespeare's about how thinking makes it so. Or as Buddha said, our life is the creation of our mind. But we can improve this ancient idea today by explaining why most people's minds have a bias towards seeing threats and engaging in useless worry. We can also do something to change this bias by using three techniques that increase happiness, one ancient and two very new. The second step in the story is to give an account of our social lives. Again, not a complete account, just two truths, widely known but not sufficiently appreciated. One is the golden rule. Reciprocity is the most important tool for getting along with people, and I'll show you how you can use it to solve problems in your own life and avoid being exploited by those who use reciprocity against you. However, reciprocity is more than just a tool. It is also a clue about who we humans are and what we need, a clue that will be important for understanding the end of the larger story. The second truth in this part of the story is that we are all, by nature, hypocrites. And this is why it is so hard for us to follow the golden rule faithfully. Recent psychological research has uncovered the mental mechanisms that make us so good at seeing the slightest speck in our neighbor's eye and so bad at seeing the log in our own. If you know what your mind is up to and why you so easily see the world through a distorting lens of good and evil, you can take steps to reduce your self-righteousness. You can thereby reduce the frequency of conflicts with others who are equally convinced of their righteousness. At this point in the story, we'll be ready to ask, where does happiness come from? There are several different happiness hypotheses. One is that happiness comes from getting what you want. But we all know, and research confirms, that such happiness is short-lived. A more promising hypothesis is that happiness comes from within and cannot be obtained by making the world conform to your desires. This idea was widespread in the ancient world. Buddha in India and the Stoic philosophers in ancient Greece and Rome all counseled people to break their emotional attachments to people and events, which are always unpredictable and uncontrollable, and to cultivate instead an attitude of acceptance. This ancient idea deserves respect. And it is certainly true that changing your mind is usually a more effective response to frustration than is changing the world. However, I will present evidence that this second version of the happiness hypothesis is wrong. Recent research shows that there are some things worth striving for. There are external conditions of life that can make you lastingly happier. One of these conditions is relatedness, the bonds we form and need to form with others. I'll present research showing where love comes from, why passionate love always cools, and what kind of love is true love. I'll suggest that the happiness hypothesis offered by Buddha and the Stoics should be amended. Happiness comes from within, and happiness comes from without. We need the guidance of both ancient wisdom and modern science to get the balance right. The next step in this story about flourishing is to look at the conditions of human growth and development. We've all heard that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, but that is a dangerous oversimplification. Many of the things that don't kill you can damage you for life. Recent research on post-traumatic growth reveals when and why people grow from adversity and what you can do to prepare yourself for trauma or to cope with it after the fact. We have also all heard repeated urgings to cultivate virtue in ourselves because virtue is its own reward. But that, too, is an oversimplification. I'll show how concepts of virtue and morality have changed and narrowed over the centuries, and how ancient ideas about virtue and moral development may hold promise for our own age. I'll also show how positive psychology is beginning to deliver on that promise by offering you a way to diagnose and develop your own strengths and virtues. The conclusion of the story is the question of meaning. Why do some people find meaning, purpose, and fulfillment in life, but others do not? I begin with the culturally widespread idea that there is a vertical, spiritual dimension of human existence. Whether it is called nobility, virtue, or divinity, and whether or not God exists, people simply do perceive sacredness, or some ineffable goodness in others and in nature. I'll present my own research on the moral emotions of disgust, 
elevation, and awe to explain how this vertical dimension works and why the dimension is so important for understanding religious fundamentalism, the political culture war, and the human quest for meaning. I'll also consider what people mean when they ask, what is the meaning of life? And I'll give an answer to the question, an answer that draws on ancient ideas about having a purpose, but that uses very recent research to go beyond these ancient ideas, or any ideas you are likely to have encountered. In doing so, I'll revise the happiness hypothesis one last time. I could state that final version here in a few words, but I could not explain it in this brief introduction without cheapening it. Words of wisdom, the meaning of life, perhaps even the answers sought by Borges' librarians, all of these may wash over us every day, but they can do little for us unless we savor them, engage with them, question them, improve them, and connect them to our lives. That is my goal in this book. Chapter 1. The Divided Self for what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. St. Paul, Galatians, chapter 5, verse 171. If passion drives, let reason hold the reins. Benjamin Franklin. I first rode a horse in 1991 in Great Smoky National Park, North Carolina. I had been on rides as a child where some teenager led the horse by a short rope, but this was the first time it was just me and a horse, no rope. I wasn't alone. There were eight other people on eight other horses, and one of the people was a park ranger, so the ride didn't ask much of me. There was, however, one difficult moment. We were riding along a path on a steep hillside, two by two, and my horse was on the outside, walking about three feet from the edge. Then the path turned sharply to the left, and my horse was heading straight for the edge. I froze. I knew I had to steer left, but there was another horse to my left, and I didn't want to crash into it. I might have called out for help or screamed, look out, but some part of me preferred the risk of going over the edge to the certainty of looking stupid, so I just froze. I did nothing at all during the critical five seconds in which my horse and the horse to my left calmly turned to the left by themselves. As my panic subsided, I laughed at my ridiculous fear. The horse knew exactly what she was doing. She'd walked this path a hundred times, and she had no more interest in tumbling to her death than I had. She didn't need me to tell her what to do, and in fact, the few times I tried to tell her what to do, she didn't much seem to care. I had gotten it all so wrong because I had spent the previous ten years driving cars, not horses. Cars go over edges unless you tell them not to. Human thinking depends on metaphor. We understand new or complex things in relation to things we already know. For example, it's hard to think about life in general, but once you apply the metaphor life is a journey, the metaphor guides you to some conclusions. You should learn the terrain, pick a direction find some good traveling companions and enjoy the trip because there may be nothing at the end of the road. It's also hard to think about the mind, but once you pick a metaphor, it will guide your thinking. Throughout recorded history, people have lived with and tried to control animals, and these animals made their way into ancient metaphors. Buddha, for example, compared the mind to a wild elephant. In days gone by, this mind of mine used to stray wherever selfish desire or lust or pleasure would lead it. Today, this mind does not stray and is under the harmony of control, even as a wild elephant is controlled by the trainer. Plato used a similar metaphor in which the self or soul is a chariot, and the calm, rational part of the mind holds the reins. Plato's charioteer had to control two horses. The horse that is on the right or nobler side is upright in frame and well-jointed, with a high neck and a regal nose. He is a lover of honor with modesty and self-control, companion to true glory. He needs no whip and is guided by verbal commands alone. The other horse is a crooked great jumble of limbs, companion to wild boasts and indecency. He is shaggy around the ears, deaf as a post and just barely yields to horsewhip and goad combined. 
for Plato, some of the emotions and passions are good, for example, the love of honor, and they help pull the self in the right direction. But others are bad, for example, the appetites and lusts. The goal of Platonic education was to help the charioteer gain perfect control over the two horses. Sigmund Freud offered us a related model 2,300 years later. Freud said that the mind is divided into three parts. The ego, the conscious, rational self. The superego, the conscience, a sometimes too rigid commitment to the rules of society. And the id, the desire for pleasure, lots of it, sooner rather than later. The metaphor I use when I lecture on Freud is to think of the mind as a horse and buggy, a Victorian chariot in which the driver, the ego, struggles frantically to control a hungry, lustful, and disobedient horse, the id, while the driver's father, the superego, sits in the back seat lecturing the driver on what he is doing wrong. For Freud, the goal of psychoanalysis was to escape this pitiful state by strengthening the ego thus giving it more control over the id and more independence from the superego. Freud, Plato, and Buddha all lived in worlds full of domesticated animals. They were familiar with the struggle to assert one's will over a creature much larger than the self. But as the 20th century wore on, cars replaced horses, and technology gave people ever more control over their physical worlds. When people looked for metaphors, they saw the mind as the driver of a car or as a program running on a computer. It became possible to forget all about Freud's unconscious and just study the mechanisms of thinking and decision making. That's what social scientists did in the last third of the century. Social psychologists created information processing theories to explain everything from prejudice to friendship. Economists created rational choice models to explain why people do what they do. The social sciences were uniting under the idea that people are rational agents who set goals and pursue them intelligently by using the information and resources at their disposal. But then, why do people keep doing such stupid things? Why do they fail to control themselves and continue to do what they know is not good for them? I, for one, can easily muster the willpower to ignore all the desserts on the menu. But if dessert is placed on the table, I can't resist it. I can resolve to focus on a task and not get up until it is done. Yet somehow I find myself walking into the kitchen or procrastinating in other ways. I can resolve to wake up at 6 a.m. to write. Yet after I have shut off the alarm, my repeated commands to myself to get out of bed have no effect. And I understand what Plato meant when he described the bad horse as deaf as a post. But it was during some larger life decisions about dating that I really began to grasp the extent of my powerlessness. I would know exactly what I should do, yet, even as I was telling my friends that I would do it, a part of me was dimly aware that I was not going to. Feelings of guilt, lust, or fear were often stronger than reasoning. On the other hand, I was quite good at lecturing friends in similar situations about what was right for them. The Roman poet Ovid captured my situation perfectly. In Metamorphoses, Medea is torn between her love for Jason and her duty to her father. She laments, I am dragged along by a strange new force. Desire and reason are pulling in different directions. I see the right way and approve it, but follow the wrong. Modern theories about rational choice and information processing don't adequately explain weakness of the will. The older metaphors about controlling animals work beautifully. The image that I came up with for myself, as I marveled at my weakness, was that I was a rider on the back of an elephant. I'm holding the reins in my hands, and by pulling one way or the other, I can tell the elephant to turn, to stop, or to go. I can direct things, but only when the elephant doesn't have desires of his own. When the elephant really wants to do something, I'm no match for him. I have used this metaphor to guide my own thinking for 10 years. And when I began to write this book, I thought the image of a writer on an elephant would be useful in this first chapter on the divided self. However, the metaphor has turned out to be useful in every chapter of the book. To understand most important ideas in psychology, you need to understand how the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. We assume that there is one person in each body, 
but in some ways, we are each more like a committee whose members have been thrown together to do a job, but who often find themselves working at cross purposes. Our minds are divided in four ways. The fourth is the most important, for it corresponds most closely to the rider and the elephant. But the first three also contribute to our experiences of temptation, weakness, and internal conflict. First Division Mind versus Body We sometimes say that the body has a mind of its own, but the French philosopher, Michel de Montaigne, went a step further and suggested that each part of the body has its own emotions and its own agenda. Montaigne was most fascinated by the independence of the penis. We are right to note the license and disobedience of this member which thrusts itself forward so inopportunely when we do not want it to, and which so inopportunely lets us down when we most need it. It imperiously contests for authority with our will. Montaigne also noted the ways in which our facial expressions betray our secret thoughts. Our hair stands on end, our hearts race, our tongues fail to speak, and our bowels and anal sphincters undergo dilations and contractions proper to themselves, independent of our wishes or even opposed to them. Some of these effects, we know now, are caused by the autonomic nervous system, the network of nerves that controls the organs and glands of our bodies, a network that is completely independent of voluntary or intentional control. But the last item on Montaigne's list, the bowels, reflects the operation of a second brain. Our intestines are lined by a vast network of more than 100 million neurons. These handle all the computations needed to run the chemical refinery that processes and extracts nutrients from food. This gut brain is like a regional administrative center that handles stuff the head brain does not need to bother with. You might expect, then, that this gut brain takes its orders from the head brain and does as it is told. But the gut brain possesses a high degree of autonomy, and it continues to function well even if the vagus nerve, which connects the two brains together, is severed. The gut brain makes its independence known in many ways. It causes irritable bowel syndrome when it decides to flush out the intestines. It triggers anxiety in the head brain when it detects infections in the gut, leading you to act in more cautious ways that are appropriate when you are sick. And it reacts in unexpected ways to anything that affects its main neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine and serotonin. Hence, many of the initial side effects of Prozac and other selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors involve nausea and changes in bowel function. Trying to improve the workings of the head brain can directly interfere with those of the gut brain. Combined with the autonomic nature of changes to the genitals, probably contributed to ancient Indian theories in which the abdomen contains the three lower chakras, energy centers corresponding to the colon, anus, sexual organs, and gut. The gut chakra is even said to be the source of gut feelings and intuitions, that is, ideas that appear to come from somewhere outside one's own mind. When St. Paul lamented the battle of flesh versus spirit, he was surely referring to some of the same divisions and frustrations that Montaigne experienced. Second Division Left versus Right a second division was discovered by accident in the 1960s when a surgeon began cutting people's brains in half. The surgeon, Joe Bogan, had a good reason for doing this. He was trying to help people whose lives were destroyed by frequent and massive epileptic seizures. The human brain has two separate hemispheres joined by a large bundle of nerves, the corpus callosum. Seizures always begin at one spot in the brain and spread to the surrounding brain tissue. If a seizure crosses over the corpus callosum, it can spread to the entire brain, causing the person to lose consciousness, fall down, and writhe uncontrollably. Just as a military leader might blow up a bridge to prevent an enemy from crossing it, Bogan wanted to sever the corpus callosum to prevent the seizures from spreading. At first glance, this was an insane tactic. The corpus callosum is the largest single bundle of nerves in the entire body, so it must be doing something important. Indeed it is. It allows the two halves of the brain to communicate and coordinate their activity. Yet research on animals found that, within a few weeks of surgery, 
the animals were pretty much back to normal. So Bogan took a chance with human patients, and it worked. The intensity of the seizures was greatly reduced. But was there really no loss of ability? To find out, the surgical team brought in a young psychologist, Michael Gazaniga, whose job was to look for the after effects of this split brain surgery. Gazaniga took advantage of the fact that the brain divides its processing of the world into its two hemispheres, left and right. The left hemisphere takes in information from the right half of the world. That is, it receives nerve transmissions from the right arm and leg, the right ear, and the left half of each retina, which receives light from the right half of the visual field, and sends out commands to move the limbs on the right side of the body. The right hemisphere is in this respect the left's mirror image, taking in information from the left half of the world and controlling movement on the left side of the body. Nobody knows why the signals cross over in this way in all vertebrates. They just do. But in other respects, the two hemispheres are specialized for different tasks. The left hemisphere is specialized for language processing and analytical tasks. In visual tasks, it is better at noticing details. The right hemisphere is better at processing patterns in space, including that all-important pattern, the face. This is the origin of popular and oversimplified ideas about artists being right-brained and scientists being left-brained. Gazaniga used the brain's division of labor to present information to each half of the brain separately. He asked patients to stare at a spot on a screen and then flashed a word or a picture of an object just to the right of the spot or just to the left so quickly that there was not enough time for the patient to move her gaze. If a picture of a hat was flashed just to the right of the spot, the image would register on the left half of each retina after the image had passed through the cornea and been inverted, which then sent its neural information back to the visual processing areas in the left hemisphere. Gazaniga would then ask, what did you see? Because the left hemisphere has full language capabilities, the patient would quickly and easily say, a hat. If the image of the hat was flashed to the left of the spot, however, the image was sent back only to the right hemisphere, which does not control speech. When Gazaniga asked, what did you see? The patient, responding from the left hemisphere, said, nothing. But when Gazaniga asked the patient to use her left hand to point to the correct image on a card showing several images, she would point to the hat. Although the right hemisphere had indeed seen the hat, it did not report verbally on what it had seen because it did not have access to the language centers in the left hemisphere. It was as if a separate intelligence was trapped in the right hemisphere, its only output device, the left hand. When Gazaniga flashed different pictures to the two hemispheres, things grew weirder. On one occasion, he flashed a picture of a chicken claw on the right, and a picture of a house and a car covered in snow on the left. The patient was then shown an array of pictures and asked to point to the one that goes with what he had seen. The patient's right hand pointed to a picture of a chicken, which went with the chicken claw the left hemisphere had seen. But the left hand pointed to a picture of a shovel, which went with the snow scene presented to the right hemisphere. When the patient was asked to explain his two responses, he did not say, I have no idea why my left hand is pointing to a shovel. It must be something you showed my right brain. Instead, the left hemisphere instantly made up a plausible story. The patient said without any hesitation, Oh, that's easy. The chicken claw goes with the chicken, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. This finding, that people will readily fabricate reasons to explain their own behavior, is called confabulation. Confabulation is so frequent in work with split brain patients and other people suffering brain damage that Gazaniga refers to the language centers on the left side of the brain as the interpreter module, whose job is to give a running commentary on whatever the self is doing, even though the interpreter module has no access to the real causes or motives of the self's behavior. For example, if the word walk is flashed to the right hemisphere, the patient might stand up and walk away. When asked why he is getting up, he might say, I'm going to get a Coke. The interpreter module is good at making up explanations, but not at knowing that it has done so. Science has made even stranger discoveries. 
in some split-brain patients or in others who have suffered damage to the corpus callosum. The right hemisphere seems to be actively fighting with the left hemisphere in a condition known as alien hand syndrome. In these cases, one hand, usually the left, acts of its own accord and seems to have its own agenda. The alien hand may pick up a ringing phone, but then refuse to pass the phone to the other hand or bring it up to an ear. The hand rejects choices the person has just made, for example, by putting back on the rack a shirt that the other hand has just picked out. It grabs the wrist of the other hand and tries to stop it from executing the person's conscious plans. Sometimes, the alien hand actually reaches for the person's own neck and tries to strangle him. These dramatic splits of the mind are caused by rare splits of the brain. Normal people are not split-brained. Yet the split-brain studies were important in psychology because they showed in such an eerie way that the mind is a confederation of modules capable of working independently and even sometimes at cross-purposes. Split-brain studies are important for this book because they show in such a dramatic way that one of these modules is good at inventing convincing explanations for your behavior, even when it has no knowledge of the causes of your behavior. Kazanaga's interpreter module is, essentially, the writer. You'll catch the writer confabulating in several later chapters. Third Division New versus Old If you live in a relatively new suburban house, your home was probably built in less than a year, and its rooms were laid out by an architect who tried to make them fulfill people's needs. The houses on my street, however, were all built around 1900 and since then they have expanded out into their backyards. Porches were extended, then enclosed, then turned into kitchens. Extra bedrooms were built above these extensions, then bathrooms were tacked on to these new rooms. The brain in vertebrates has similarly expanded, but in a forward direction. The brain started off with just three rooms, or clumps of neurons. A hind brain, connected to the spinal column, a midbrain, and a forebrain, connected to the sensory organs at the front of the animal. Over time, as more complex bodies and behaviors evolved, the brain kept building out the front, away from the spinal column, expanding the forebrain more than any other part. The forebrain of the earliest mammals developed a new outer shell, which included the hypothalamus, specialized to coordinate basic drives and motivations, the hippocampus, specialized for memory, and the amygdala, specialized for emotional learning and responding. These structures are sometimes referred to as the limbic system, from Latin limbus, border or margin, because they wrap around the rest of the brain, forming a border. As mammals grew in size and diversified in behavior after the dinosaurs became extinct, the remodeling continued. In the more social mammals, particularly among primates, a new layer of neural tissue developed and spread to surround the old limbic system. This neocortex, Latin for new covering, is the gray matter characteristic of human brains. The front portion of the neocortex is particularly interesting, for parts of it do not appear to be dedicated to specific tasks, such as moving a finger or processing sound. Instead, it is available to make new associations and to engage in thinking planning, and decision-making, mental processes that can free an organism from responding only to an immediate situation. This growth of the frontal cortex seems like a promising explanation for the divisions we experience in our minds. Perhaps the frontal cortex is the seat of reason. It is Plato's charioteer, it is St. Paul's spirit, and it has taken over control, though not perfectly, from the more primitive limbic system, Plato's bad horse. St. Paul's flesh. We can call this explanation the Promethean script of human evolution, after the character in Greek mythology who stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans. In this script, our ancestors were mere animals governed by the primitive emotions and drives of the limbic system, until they received the divine gift of reason installed in the newly expanded neocortex. The Promethean script is pleasing in that it neatly raises us above all other animals, justifying our superiority by our rationality. 
At the same time, it captures our sense that we are not yet gods, that the fire of rationality is somehow new to us, and we have not yet fully mastered it. The Promethean script also fits well with some important early findings about the roles of the limbic system and the frontal cortex. For example, when some regions of the hypothalamus are stimulated directly with a small electric current, rats, cats, and other mammals can be made gluttonous, ferocious, or hypersexual, suggesting that the limbic system underlies many of our basic animal instincts. Conversely, when people suffer damage to the frontal cortex, they sometimes show an increase in sexual and aggressive behavior because the frontal cortex plays an important role in suppressing or inhibiting behavioral impulses. There was recently such a case at the University of Virginia's hospital. A school teacher in his 40s had, fairly suddenly, begun to visit prostitutes, surf child pornography websites, and proposition young girls. He was soon arrested and convicted of child molestation. The day before his sentencing, he went to the hospital emergency room because he had a pounding headache and was experiencing a constant urge to rape his landlady. His wife had thrown him out of the house months earlier. Even while he was talking to the doctor, he asked passing nurses to sleep with him. A brain scan found that an enormous tumor in his frontal cortex was squeezing everything else preventing the frontal cortex from doing its job of inhibiting inappropriate behavior and thinking about consequences. Who in his right mind would put on such a show the day before his sentencing? When the tumor was removed, the hypersexuality vanished. Moreover, when the tumor grew back the following year, the symptoms returned, and when the tumor was removed again, the symptoms disappeared again. There is, however, a flaw in the Promethean script. It assumes that reason was installed in the frontal cortex, but that emotion stayed behind in the limbic system. In fact, the frontal cortex enabled a great expansion of emotionality in humans. The lower third of the prefrontal cortex is called the orbitofrontal cortex because it is the part of the brain just above the eyes. Orbit is the Latin term for the eye socket. This region of the cortex has grown especially large in humans and other primates and is one of the most consistently active areas of the brain during emotional reactions. The orbitofrontal cortex plays a central role when you size up the reward and punishment possibilities of a situation. The neurons in this part of the cortex fire wildly when there is an immediate possibility of pleasure or pain, loss or gain. When you feel yourself drawn to a meal, landscape or an attractive person, or repelled by a dead animal, a bad song, or a blind date, your orbitofrontal cortex is working hard to give you an emotional feeling of wanting to approach or to get away. The orbitofrontal cortex therefore appears to be a better candidate for the id, or for St. Paul's flesh, than for the superego or the spirit. The importance of the orbitofrontal cortex for emotion has been further demonstrated by research on brain damage. The neurologist Antonio Damasio has studied people who, because of a stroke, tumor, or blow to the head, have lost various parts of their frontal cortex. In the 1990s, Damasio found that when certain parts of the orbitofrontal cortex are damaged, patients lose most of their emotional lives. They report that when they ought to feel emotion, they feel nothing. And studies of their autonomic reactions, such as those used in lie detector tests, confirm that they lack the normal flashes of bodily reaction that the rest of us experience when observing scenes of horror or beauty. Yet their reasoning and logical abilities are intact. They perform normally on tests of intelligence and knowledge of social rules and moral principles. So what happens when these people go out into the world? Now that they are free of the distractions of emotion, do they become hyperlogical? able to see through the haze of feelings that blinds the rest of us to the path of perfect rationality? Just the opposite. They find themselves unable to make simple decisions or to set goals, and their lives fall apart. When they look out at the world and think, what should I do now? They see dozens of choices, but lack immediate internal feelings of like or dislike. They must examine the pros and cons of every choice with their reasoning but in the absence of feeling, they see little reason to pick one or the other. When the rest of us look out at the world, 
our emotional brains have instantly and automatically appraised the possibilities. One possibility usually jumps out at us as the obvious best one. We need only use reason to weigh the pros and cons when two or three possibilities seem equally good. Human rationality depends critically on sophisticated emotionality. It is only because our emotional brains work so well that our reasoning can work at all. Plato's image of reason as charioteer controlling the dumb beasts of passion may overstate not only the wisdom, but also the power of the charioteer. The metaphor of a rider on an elephant fits Damasio's findings more closely. Reason and emotion must both work together to create intelligent behavior, but emotion, a major part of the elephant, does most of the work. When the neocortex came along, it made the writer possible, but it made the elephant much smarter too. Fourth Division, Controlled versus Automatic. In the 1990s, while I was developing the elephant writer metaphor for myself, the field of social psychology was coming to a similar view of the mind. After its long infatuation with information processing models and the computer metaphors, Psychologists began to realize that there are really two processing systems at work in the mind at all times, controlled processes and automatic processes. Suppose you volunteered to be a subject in the following experiment. First, the experimenter hands you some word problems and tells you to come and get her when you are finished. The word problems are easy, just unscramble sets of five words and make sentences using four of them. For example, they, her, father, see, usually, becomes either they usually see her or they usually bother her. A few minutes later, when you have finished the test, you go out to the hallway as instructed. The experimenter is there, but she's engaged in a conversation with someone and isn't making eye contact with you. What do you suppose you'll do? Well, if half the sentences you unscrambled contained words related to rudeness, such as bother, brazen, aggressively, you will probably interrupt the experimenter within a minute or two to say, hey, I'm finished, what should I do now? But if you unscrambled sentences in which the rude words were swapped with words related to politeness, they, her, respect, see, usually, the odds are you'll just sit there meekly and wait until the experimenter acknowledges you 10 minutes from now. Likewise, Exposure to words related to the elderly makes people walk more slowly. Words related to professors make people smarter at the game of trivial pursuit. And words related to soccer hooligans make people dumber. And these effects don't even depend on your consciously reading the words. The same effects can occur when the words are presented subliminally, that is, flashed on a screen for just a few hundredths of a second, too fast for your conscious mind to register them. But some part of the mind does see the words, and it sets in motion behaviors that psychologists can measure. According to John Barge, the pioneer in this research, these experiments show that most mental processes happen automatically, without the need for conscious attention or control. Most automatic processes are completely unconscious, although some of them show a part of themselves to consciousness. For example, we are aware of the stream of consciousness that seems to flow on by following its own rules of association without any feeling of effort or direction from the self. Barge contrasts automatic processes with controlled processes, the kind of thinking that takes some effort, that proceeds in steps and that always plays out on the center stage of consciousness. For example, at what time would you need to leave your house to catch a 626 flight to London? That's something you have to think about consciously, first choosing a means of transport to the airport and then considering rush hour traffic, weather, and the strictness of the shoe police at the airport. You can't depart on a hunch, but if you drive to the airport, almost everything you do on the way will be automatic. Breathing, blinking, shifting in your seat, daydreaming, keeping enough distance between you and the car in front of you, even scowling and cursing slower drivers. Controlled processing is limited. We can think consciously about one thing at a time only, but automatic processes run in parallel and can handle many tasks at once. If the mind performs hundreds of operations each second, all but one of them must be handled automatically. 
So what is the relationship between controlled and automatic processing? Is controlled processing the wise boss, king, or CEO handling the most important questions and setting policy with foresight for the dumber automatic processes to carry out? No. That would bring us right back to the Promethean script and divine reason. To dispel the Promethean script once and for all, it will help to go back in time and look at why we have these two processes, why we have a small writer and a large elephant. When the first clumps of neurons were forming the first brains more than 600 million years ago, these clumps must have conferred some advantage on the organisms that had them because brains have proliferated ever since. Brains are adaptive because they integrate information from various parts of the animal's body to respond quickly and automatically to threats and opportunities in the environment. By the time we reached three million years ago, the Earth was full of animals with extraordinarily sophisticated automatic abilities, among them birds that could navigate by star positions, ants that could cooperate to fight wars and run fungus farms, and several species of hominids that had begun to make tools. Many of these creatures possessed systems of communication, but none of them had developed language. Controlled processing requires language. You can have bits and pieces of thought through images, but to plan something complex, to weigh the pros and cons of different paths, or to analyze the causes of past successes and failures, you need words. Nobody knows how long ago human beings developed language, but most estimates range from around 2 million years ago, when hominid brains became much bigger, to as recently as 40,000 years ago, the time of cave paintings and other artifacts that reveal unmistakably modern human minds. Whichever end of that range you favor, language, reasoning, and conscious planning arrived in the most recent eye blink of evolution. They are like new software, Rider version 1.0. The language parts work well, but there are still a lot of bugs in the reasoning and planning programs. Automatic processes, on the other hand, have been through thousands of product cycles and are nearly perfect. This difference in maturity between automatic and controlled processes helps explain why we have inexpensive computers that can solve logic, math, and chess problems better than any human beings can. Most of us struggle with these tasks. But none of our robots, no matter how costly, can walk through the woods as well as the average six-year-old child. Our perceptual and motor systems are superb. Evolution never looks ahead. It can't plan the best way to travel from point A to point B. Instead, small changes to existing forms arise by genetic mutation and spread within a population to the extent that they help organisms respond more effectively to current conditions. When language evolved, the human brain was not re-engineered to hand over the reins of power to the writer, conscious verbal thinking. Things were already working pretty well and linguistic ability spread to the extent that it helped the elephant do something important in a better way. The writer evolved to serve to the elephant. But whatever its origin, once we had it, language was a powerful tool that could be used in new ways, and evolution then selected those individuals who got the best use out of it. One use of language is that it partially freed humans from stimulus control. Behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner were able to explain much of the behavior of animals as a set of connections between stimuli and responses. Some of these connections are innate, such as when the sight or smell of an animal's natural food triggers hunger and eating. Other connections are learned, as demonstrated by Ivan Pavlov's dogs, who salivated at the sound of a bell that had earlier announced the arrival of food. The behaviorists saw animals as slaves to their environments and learning histories who blindly respond to the reward properties of whatever they encounter. The behaviorists thought that people were no different from other animals. In this view, St. Paul's lament could be restated as, My flesh is under stimulus control. It is no accident that we find the carnal pleasures so rewarding. Our brains, like rat brains, are wired so that food and sex give us little bursts of dopamine, the neurotransmitter that is the brain's way of making us enjoy the activities that are good for the survival of our genes. 
Plato's bad horse plays an important role in pulling us toward these things, which helped our ancestors survive and succeed in becoming our ancestors. But the behaviorists were not exactly right about people. The controlled system allows people to think about long-term goals and thereby escape the tyranny of the here and now, the automatic triggering of temptation by the sight of tempting objects. People can imagine alternatives that are not visually present. They can weigh long-term health risks against present pleasures, and they can learn in conversation about which choices will bring success and prestige. Unfortunately, the behaviorists were not entirely wrong about people either, for although the controlled system does not conform to behaviorist principles, it also has relatively little power to cause behavior. The automatic system was shaped by natural selection to trigger quick and reliable action, and it includes parts of the brain that make us feel pleasure and pain, such as the orbitofrontal cortex, and that trigger survival-related motivations, such as the hypothalamus, the automatic system has its finger on the dopamine release button. The controlled system, in contrast, is better seen as an advisor. It's a rider placed on the elephant's back to help the elephant make better choices. The rider can see farther into the future, and the rider can learn valuable information by talking to other riders or by reading maps. But the rider cannot order the elephant around against its will. I believe the Scottish philosopher David Hume was closer to the truth than was Plato when he said, Reason is, and ought only to be the slave of the passions, and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. In sum, the writer is an advisor or servant, not a king, president, or charioteer with a firm grip on the reins. The writer is Gazaniga's interpreter module. It is conscious, controlled thought. The elephant, in contrast, is everything else. The elephant includes the gut feelings, visceral reactions, emotions, and intuitions that comprise much of the automatic system. The elephant and the rider each have their own intelligence, and when they work together well, they enable the unique brilliance of human beings. But they don't always work together well. Here are three quirks of daily life that illustrate the sometimes complex relationship between the rider and the elephant. Failures of self-control Imagine that it is 1970 and you are a four-year-old child in an experiment being conducted by Walter Michel at Stanford University. You are brought into a room at your preschool where a nice man gives you toys and plays with you for a while. Then the man asks you first whether you like marshmallows, you do, and then whether you'd rather have this plate here with one marshmallow or that plate there with two marshmallows that one, of course. Then the man tells you that he has to go out of the room for a little while, and if you can wait until he comes back, you can have the two marshmallows. If you don't want to wait, you can ring this bell here, and he'll come right back and give you the plate with one. But if you do that, you can't have the two. The man leaves. You stare at the marshmallows. You salivate. You want. You fight your wanting. If you are like most four-year-olds, you can hold out for only a few minutes. Then you ring the bell. Now let's jump ahead to 1985. Michelle has mailed your parents a questionnaire asking them to report on your personality, your ability to delay gratification and deal with frustration, and your performance on your college entrance exams, the Scholastic Aptitude Test. Your parents return the questionnaire. Michelle discovers that the number of seconds you waited to ring the bell in 1970 predicts not only what your parents say about you as a teenager, but also the likelihood that you were admitted to a top university. Children who were able to overcome stimulus control and delay gratification for a few extra minutes in 1970 were better able to resist temptation as teenagers to focus on their studies and to control themselves when things didn't go the way they wanted. What was their secret? A large part of it was strategy. The ways that children used their limited mental control to shift attention. In later studies, Michelle discovered that the successful children were those who looked away from the temptation or were able to think about other enjoyable activities. These thinking skills are an aspect of emotional intelligence. 
and ability to understand and regulate one's own feelings and desires. An emotionally intelligent person has a skilled writer who knows how to distract and coax the elephant without having to engage in a direct contest of wills. It's hard for the controlled system to beat the automatic system by willpower alone. Like a tired muscle, the former soon wears down and caves in, but the latter runs automatically, effortlessly, and endlessly. Once you understand the power of stimulus control, you can use it to your advantage by changing the stimuli in your environment and avoiding undesirable ones. Or, if that's not possible, by filling your consciousness with thoughts about their less tempting aspects. Buddhism, for example, in an effort to break people's carnal attachment to their own and others' flesh, developed methods of meditating on decaying corpses. By choosing to stare at something that revolts the automatic system, the rider can begin to change what the elephant will want in the future. Mental Intrusions Edgar Allan Poe understood the divided mind. In The Imp of the Perverse, Poe's protagonist carries out the perfect murder, inherits the dead man's estate, and lives for years in healthy enjoyment of his ill-gotten gains. Whenever thoughts of the murder appear on the fringes of his consciousness, he murmurs to himself, I am safe. All is well until the day he remodels his mantra to, I am safe, yes, if I be not fool enough to make open confession. With that thought, he comes undone. He tries to suppress the thought of confessing, but the harder he tries, the more insistent the thought becomes. He panics, he starts running, people start chasing him, he blacks out, and when he returns to his senses, he is told that he has made a full confession. I love this story for its title above all else. Whenever I am on a cliff, a rooftop, or a high balcony, the imp of the perverse whispers in my ear, jump. It's not a command. It's just a word that pops into my consciousness. When I'm at a dinner party sitting next to someone I respect, the imp works hard to suggest the most inappropriate things I could possibly say. Who or what is the imp? Dan Wegner, one of the most perverse and creative social psychologists, has dragged the imp into the lab and made it confess to being an aspect of automatic processing. In Wegner's studies, participants are asked to try hard not to think about something such as a white bear or food or a stereotype. This is hard to do. More important, the moment one stops trying to suppress a thought, the thought comes flooding in and becomes even harder to banish. In other words, Wegner creates minor obsessions in his lab by instructing people not to obsess. Wegner explains this effect as an ironic process of mental control. When controlled processing tries to influence thought, don't think about a white bear, it sets up an explicit goal. And whenever one pursues a goal, a part of the mind automatically monitors progress so that it can order corrections or know when success has been achieved. When that goal is an action in the world, such as arriving at the airport on time, this feedback system works well. But when the goal is mental, it backfires. Automatic processes continually check. Am I not thinking about a white bear? As the act of monitoring for the absence of the thought introduces the thought, the person must try even harder to divert consciousness. Automatic and controlled processes end up working at cross purposes, firing each other up to ever greater exertions. But because controlled processes tire quickly, eventually the inexhaustible automatic processes run unopposed, conjuring up herds of white bears. Thus, the attempt to remove an unpleasant thought can guarantee it a place on your frequent playlist of mental ruminations. Now, back to me at that dinner party. My simple thought, don't make a fool of yourself, triggers automatic processes looking for signs of foolishness. I know that it would be stupid to comment on that mole on his forehead, or to say, I love you, or to scream obscenities. And up in consciousness, I become aware of three thoughts. Comment on the mole, say I love you, or scream obscenities. These are not commands, just ideas that pop into my head. Freud, 
based much of his theory of psychoanalysis on such mental intrusions and free associations, and he found they often have sexual or aggressive content. But Wegner's research offers a simpler and more innocent explanation. Automatic processes generate thousands of thoughts and images every day, often through random association. The ones that get stuck are the ones that particularly shock us, the ones we try to suppress or deny. The reason we suppress them is not that we know deep down that they're true, although some may be, but that they are scary or shameful. Yet once we have tried and failed to suppress them, they can become the sorts of obsessive thoughts that make us believe in Freudian notions of a dark and evil unconscious mind. The Difficulty of Winning an Argument Consider the following story. Julie and Mark are sister and brother. They are traveling together in France on summer vacation from college. One night, they are staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decide that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie is already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy making love, but decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret which makes them feel even closer to each other. Do you think it is acceptable for two consenting adults who happen to be siblings to make love? If you are like most people in my studies, you immediately answered no. But how would you justify that judgment? People often reach first for the argument that incestuous sex leads to offspring that suffer genetic abnormalities. When I point out that the siblings used two forms of birth control, however, no one says, Oh, well, in that case, it's okay. Instead, people begin searching for other arguments. For example, it's going to harm their relationship. When I respond that in this case the sex has made the relationship stronger, people just scratch their heads, frown, and say, I know it's wrong. I'm just having a hard time explaining why. The point of these studies is that moral judgment is like aesthetic judgment. When you see a painting, you usually know instantly and automatically whether you like it. If someone asks you to explain your judgment, you confabulate. You don't really know why you think something is beautiful, but your interpreter module, the writer, is skilled at making up reasons, as Gazaniga found in his split brain studies. You search for a plausible reason for liking the painting, and you latch on to the first reason that makes sense. Maybe something vague about color or light, or the reflection of the painter in the clown's shiny nose. Moral arguments are much the same. Two people feel strongly about an issue. Their feelings come first, and their reasons are invented on the fly to throw at each other. When you refute a person's argument, does she generally change her mind and agree with you? Of course not, because the argument you defeated was not the cause of her position. It was made up after the judgment was already made. If you listen closely to moral arguments, you can sometimes hear something surprising. That it is really the elephant holding the reins, guiding the rider. It is the elephant who decides what is good or bad, beautiful or ugly. Gut feelings, intuitions, and snap judgments happen constantly and automatically, as Malcolm Gladwell described in Blink. But only the rider can string sentences together and create arguments to give to other people. In moral arguments, the writer goes beyond being just an advisor to the elephant. He becomes a lawyer, fighting in the court of public opinion to persuade others of the elephant's point of view. This, then, is our situation, lamented by St. Paul, Buddha, Ovid, and so many others. Our minds are loose confederations of parts, but we identify with and pay too much attention to one part conscious verbal thinking. We are like the proverbial drunken man looking for his car keys under the street light. Did you drop them here? asks the cop. No, says the man. I dropped them back there in the alley, but the light is better over here. Because we can see only one little corner of the mind's vast operation, we are surprised when urges, wishes, and temptations emerge seemingly from nowhere. We make pronouncements, vows and resolutions, and then are surprised by our own powerlessness to carry them out. 
we sometimes fall into the view that we are fighting with our unconscious, our id, or our animal self. But really, we are the whole thing. We are the rider, and we are the elephant. Both have their strengths and special skills. The rest of this book is about how complex and partly clueless creatures such as ourselves can get along with each other, chapters 3 and 4, find happiness, chapters 5 and 6, grow psychologically and morally, chapters 7 and 8, and find purpose and meaning in our lives, chapters 9 and 10. But first, we have to figure out why the elephant is such a pessimist. Chapter 2. Changing Your Mind The whole universe is change and life itself is but what you deem it. Marcus Aurelius What we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday, and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. Buddha The most important idea in pop psychology is contained in the two quotations above. Events in the world affect us only through our interpretations of them. So if we can control our interpretations, we can control our world. The best-selling self-help advisor of all time, Dale Carnegie, writing in 1944, called the last eight words of the Aurelius quote, eight words that can transform your life. More recently, on television and the internet, Dr. Phil, Phil McGraw, stated as one of his ten laws of life, there is no reality, only perception. Self-help books and seminars sometimes seem to consist of little more than lecturing and hectoring people until they understand this idea and its implications for their lives. It can be inspiring to watch. Often a moment comes when a person consumed by years of resentment, pain, and anger realizes that her father, for example, didn't directly hurt her when he abandoned the family. All he did was move out of the house. His action was morally wrong, but the pain came from her reactions to the event. And if she can change those reactions, she can leave behind 20 years of pain and perhaps even get to know her father. The art of pop psychology is to develop a method, beyond lecturing and hectoring, that guides people to that realization. This art is old. Consider Anicius Boethius. Born to one of the most distinguished Roman families in 480 CE, four years after Rome fell to the Goths, Boethius received the best education available in his day and successfully pursued careers in philosophy and public service. He wrote or translated dozens of works on math, science, logic, and theology, at the same time rising to become consul of Rome, the highest elected office in 510. He was wealthy. He married well, and his sons went on to become consuls themselves. But in 523, at the peak of his power and fortune, Boethius was accused of treason toward the Ostrogoth king Theodoric for remaining loyal to Rome and its senate. Condemned by the cowardly senate he had tried to defend, Boethius was stripped of his wealth and honor, thrown into prison on a remote island, and executed in 524. To take something philosophically means to accept a great misfortune without weeping or even suffering. We use this term in part because of the calmness, self-control, and courage that three ancient philosophers, Socrates, Seneca, and Boethius, showed while they awaited their executions. But in The Consolation of Philosophy, which Boethius wrote while in prison, he confessed that at first he was anything but philosophical. He wept and wrote poems about weeping. He cursed injustice and old age and the goddess of fortune, who had blessed him and then abandoned him. Then one night, while Boethius was wallowing in his wretchedness, the majestic apparition of Lady Philosophy visits him and proceeds to chide him for his unphilosophical behavior. Lady Philosophy then guides Boethius through reinterpretations that foreshadow modern cognitive therapy. She begins by asking Boethius to think about his relationship with the goddess of fortune. Philosophy reminds Boethius that fortune is fickle, coming and going as she pleases. Boethius took fortune as his mistress, fully aware of her ways, 
and she stayed with him for a long time. What right has he now to demand that she be chained to his side? Lady Philosophy presents Fortune's defense. Why should I alone be deprived of my rights? The heavens are permitted to grant bright days, then blot them out with dark nights. The year may decorate the face of the earth with flowers and fruits, then make it barren again with clouds and frost. The sea is allowed to invite the sailor with fair weather, then terrify him with storms. Shall I then permit man's insatiable cupidity to tie me down to a sameness that is alien to my habits? Lady Philosophy reframes change as normal and as the right of fortune. The whole universe is change, Aurelius had said. Boethius was fortunate. Now he is not. That is no cause for anger. Rather, he should be grateful that he enjoyed fortune for so long, and he should be calm now that she has left him. No man can ever be secure until he has been forsaken by fortune. Lady Philosophy tries several other reframing tactics. She points out that his wife, sons, and father are each dearer to him than his own life, and all four still live. She helps him see that adverse fortune is more beneficial than good fortune. The latter only makes men greedy for more, but adversity makes them strong and she draws Boethius's imagination far up into the heavens so that he can look down on the earth and see it as a tiny speck on which even tinier people play out their comical and ultimately insignificant ambitions. She gets him to admit that riches and fame bring anxiety and avarice, not peace and happiness. After being shown these new perspectives and having his old assumptions challenged, Boethius is finally prepared to absorb the greatest lesson of all, the lesson Buddha and Aurelius had taught centuries earlier. Nothing is miserable unless you think it so. And on the other hand, nothing brings happiness unless you are content with it. When he takes this lesson to heart, Boethius frees himself from his mental prison. He regains his composure, writes a book that has comforted people for centuries, and faces his death with dignity. I don't mean to imply that the consolation of philosophy is just Roman pop psychology, but it does tell a story of freedom through insight that I would like to question. In the previous chapter, I suggested that our divided self is like a rider on the back of an elephant, and I said that we give far too much importance to the rider, conscious thought. Lady philosophy, like the pop psychology gurus of today, was working with the writer, guiding him to a moment of cognitive insight and reframing. Yet, if you have ever achieved such dramatic insights into your own life and resolved to change your ways or your outlook, you probably found that, three months later, you are right back where you started. Epiphanies can be life-altering, but most fade in days or weeks. The writer can't just decide to change and then order the elephant to go along with the program. Lasting change can come only by retraining the elephant, and that's hard to do. When pop psychology programs are successful in helping people, which they sometimes are, they succeed not because of the initial moment of insight, but because they find ways to alter people's behavior over the following months. They keep people involved with the program long enough to retrain the elephant. This chapter is about why the elephant tends toward worry and pessimism in so many people, and about three tools that the writer can use to retrain it. The Lycometer The most important words in the elephant's language are like and dislike, or approach and withdraw. Even the simplest animal must make decisions at every moment. Left or right, go or stop, eat or don't eat. Animals with brains complex enough to have emotions make these decisions effortlessly and automatically by having what is sometimes called a lycometer running in their heads at all times. If a monkey tasting a new fruit feels a sweet sensation, its lycometer registers, I like it. The monkey feels pleasure and bites right in. If the taste is bitter, a flash of displeasure discourages further eating. There's no need for a weighing of pros and cons, or for a reasoning system. Just flashes of pleasure and displeasure. We humans have a lycometer too, 
and it's always running. Its influence is subtle, but careful experiments show that you have a like-dislike reaction to everything you are experiencing, even if you're not aware of the experience. For example, suppose you are a participant in an experiment on what is known as effective priming. You sit in front of a computer screen and stare at a dot in the center. Every few seconds, a word is flashed over the dot. All you have to do is tap a key with your left hand if the word means something good or likable, such as garden, hope, fun, or tap a key with your right hand if the word means something bad or dislikable, death, tyranny, boredom. It seems easy, but for some reason you find yourself hesitating for a split second on some of the words. Unbeknownst to you, the computer is always flashing up another word right on the dot just for a few hundredths of a second before putting up the target word you're rating. Though these words are presented subliminally, below the level of your awareness, your intuitive system is so fast that it reads and reacts to them with a lycometer rating. If the subliminal word is fear, it would register negative on your lycometer, making you feel a tiny flash of displeasure. And then, a split second later, when you see the word boredom, you would more quickly say that boredom is bad. Your negative evaluation of boredom has been facilitated or primed by your tiny flash of negativity toward fear. If, however, the word following fear is garden, you would take longer to say that garden is good because of the time it takes for your lycometer to shift from bad to good. The discovery of effective priming in the 1980s opened up a world of indirect measurement in psychology. It became possible to bypass the writer and talk directly to the elephant, and what the elephant has to say is sometimes disturbing. For example, what if, instead of flashing subliminal words, we use photographs of black and white faces? Researchers have found that Americans of all ages, classes, and political affiliations react with a flash of negativity to black faces or to other images and words associated with African American culture. People who report being unprejudiced against blacks show, on average, a slightly smaller automatic prejudice, but apparently the writer and the elephant each have an opinion. You can test your own elephant at www.projectimplicit.com. Even many African Americans show this implicit prejudice, although others show an implicit preference for black faces and names. On balance, African Americans come out with no implicit bias either way. One of the most bizarre demonstrations of the lycometer in action comes from the work of Brett Pelham, who has discovered that one's lycometer is triggered by one's own name. Whenever you see or hear a word that resembles your name, a little flash of pleasure biases you toward thinking the thing is good. So when a man named Dennis is considering a career, he ponders the possibilities. Lawyer, doctor, banker, dentist, dentist. Something about dentist just feels right. And in fact, people named Dennis or Denise are slightly more likely than people with other names to become dentists. Men named Lawrence and women named Lori are more likely to become lawyers. Louis and Louise are more likely to move to Louisiana or St. Louis. And George and Georgina are more likely to move to Georgia. The own name preference even shows up in marriage records. People are slightly more likely to marry people whose names sound like their own, even if the similarity is just sharing a first initial. When Pelham presented his findings to my academic department, I was shocked to realize that most of the married people in the room illustrated his claim, Jerry and Judy, Brian and Bethany, and the winners were me, John, and my wife, Jane. The unsettling implication of Pelham's work is that the three biggest decisions most of us make, what to do with our lives, where to live, and whom to marry, can all be influenced, even if only slightly, by something as trivial as the sound of a name. Life is indeed what we deem it, but the deeming happens quickly and unconsciously. The elephant reacts instinctively and steers the rider toward a new destination. Negativity Bias 
Clinical psychologists sometimes say that two kinds of people seek therapy, those who need tightening and those who need loosening. But for every patient seeking help in becoming more organized, self-controlled, and responsible about her future, there is a waiting room full of people hoping to loosen up, lighten up, and worry less about the stupid things they said at yesterday's staff meeting or about the rejection they are sure will follow tomorrow's lunch date. For most people, the elephant sees too many things as bad and not enough as good. It makes sense. If you were designing the mind of a fish, would you have it respond as strongly to opportunities as to threats? No way. The cost of missing a cue that signals food is low. Odds are that there are other fish in the sea, and one mistake won't lead to starvation. The cost of missing the sign of a nearby predator, however, can be catastrophic. Game over, end of the line for those genes. Of course, evolution has no designer, but minds created by natural selection end up looking to us as though they were designed because they generally produce behavior that is flexibly adaptive in their ecological niches. See Steven Pinker on how natural selection designs without a designer. Some commonalities of animal life even create similarities across species that we might call design principles. One such principle is that bad is stronger than good. Responses to threats and unpleasantness are faster, stronger, and harder to inhibit than responses to opportunities and pleasures. This principle, called negativity bias, shows up all over psychology. In marital interactions, it takes at least five good or constructive actions to make up for the damage done by one critical or destructive act. In financial transactions and gambles, the pleasure of gaining a certain amount of money is smaller than the pain of losing the same amount. In evaluating a person's character, people estimate that it would take 25 acts of life-saving heroism to make up for one act of murder. When preparing a meal, food is easily contaminated by a single cockroach antenna, but difficult to purify. Over and over again, psychologists find that the human mind reacts to bad things more quickly, strongly, and persistently than to equivalent good things. We can't just will ourselves to see everything as good because our minds are wired to find and react to threats, violations, and setbacks. As Ben Franklin said, we are not so sensible of the greatest health as of the least sickness. Here's another candidate for a design principle of animal life. Opposing systems push against each other to reach a balance point, but the balance point is adjustable. When you move your arm, one set of muscles extends it and another contracts it. Both are always slightly tensed, ready for action. Your heart rate and breathing are regulated by an autonomic nervous system composed of two subsystems that push your organs in opposite directions. The sympathetic system prepares your body for fight or flight, and the parasympathetic system calms you down. Both are active all the time in different ratios. Your behavior is governed by opposing motivational systems, an approach system which triggers positive emotions and makes you want to move towards certain things, and a withdrawal system which triggers negative emotions and makes you want to pull back or avoid other things. Both systems are always active, monitoring the environment, and the two systems can produce opposing motives at the same time, as when you feel ambivalence but their relative balance determines which way you move. The lycometer is a metaphor for this balancing process and its subtle moment-by-moment -moment fluctuations. The balance can shift in an instant. You are drawn by curiosity to an accident scene, but then recoil in horror when you see the blood that you could not have been surprised to see. You want to talk to a stranger, but you find yourself suddenly paralyzed when you approach that person the withdrawal system can quickly shoot up to full power, overtaking the slower and generally weaker approach system. One reason the withdrawal system is so quick and compelling is that it gets first crack at all incoming information. All neural impulses from the eyes and ears go first to the thalamus, a kind of central switching station in the brain. 
From the thalamus, neural impulses are sent out to special sensory processing areas in the cortex. And from those areas, information is relayed to the frontal cortex, where it is integrated with other higher mental processes and your ongoing stream of consciousness. If at the end of this process you become aware of a hissing snake in front of you, you could decide to run away and then order your legs to start moving. But because neural impulses move only at about 30 meters per second, this fairly long path, including decision time, could easily take a second or two. It's easy to see why a neural shortcut would be advantageous, and the amygdala is that shortcut. The amygdala, sitting just under the thalamus, dips into the river of unprocessed information flowing through the thalamus, and it responds to patterns that in the past were associated with danger. The amygdala has a direct connection to the part of the brainstem that activates the fight or flight response. And if the amygdala finds a pattern that was part of a previous fear episode, such as the sound of a hiss, it orders the body to red alert. You have felt this happen. If you have ever thought you were alone in a room and then heard a voice behind you, or if you have ever seen a horror movie in which a knife-wielding maniac jumps into the frame without a musical forewarning, you probably flinched and your heart rate shot up. Your body reacted with fear via the quick amygdala path in the first tenth of a second before you could make sense of the event via the slower cortical path in the next nine tenths of a second. Though the amygdala does process some positive information, the brain has no equivalent green alert system to notify you instantly of a delicious meal or a likely mate. Such appraisals can take a second or two. Once again, bad is stronger and faster than good. The elephant reacts before the rider even sees the snake on the path. Although you can tell yourself that you are not afraid of snakes, if your elephant fears them and rears up, you'll still be thrown. One final point about the amygdala. Not only does it reach down to the brainstem to trigger a response to danger, but it reaches up to the frontal cortex to change your thinking. It shifts the entire brain over to a withdrawal orientation. There is a two-way street between emotions and conscious thoughts. Thoughts can cause emotions, as when you reflect on a foolish thing you said. But emotions can also cause thoughts, primarily by erasing mental filters that bias subsequent information processing. A flash of fear makes you extra vigilant for additional threats. You look at the world through a filter that interprets ambiguous events as possible dangers. A flash of anger towards someone raises a filter through which you see everything the offending person says or does as a further insult or transgression. Feelings of sadness blind you to all pleasures and opportunities. As one famous depressive put it, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. So when Shakespeare's Hamlet later offers his own paraphrase of Marcus Aurelius, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. He is right, but he might have added that his negative emotions are making his thinking make everything bad. The Cortical Lottery Hamlet was unlucky. His uncle and his mother conspired to murder his father, the king. But his long and deep depressive reaction to this setback suggests that he was unlucky in another way too. He was by nature a pessimist. When it comes to explaining personality, it's always true that nature and nurture work together. But it's also true that nature plays a bigger role than most people realize. Consider the identical twin sisters, Daphne and Barbara. Raised outside London, they both left school at the age of 14, went to work in local government, met their future husbands at the age of 16 at local town hall dances, suffered miscarriages at the same time, and then each gave birth to two boys and a girl. They feared many of the same things, blood and heights, and exhibited unusual habits. Each drank her coffee cold, each developed the habit of pushing up her nose with the palm of the hand, a gesture they both called squidging. None of this may surprise you until you learn that separate families had adopted Daphne and Barbara as infants. Neither even knew of the other's existence until they were reunited at the age of 40. When they finally did meet, they were wearing almost identical clothing. 
Such strings of coincidences are common among identical twins who were separated at birth, but they do not happen among fraternal twins who were similarly separated. On just about every trait that has been studied, identical twins who share all their genes and spend the same nine months in the same womb are more similar than same-sex fraternal twins who share only half their genes and spend the same nine months in the same womb. This finding means that genes make at least some contribution to nearly every trait. Whether the trait is intelligence, extroversion, fearfulness, religiosity, political leaning, liking for jazz, or dislike of spicy foods, identical twins are more similar than fraternal twins, and they are usually almost as similar if they were separated at birth. Genes are not blueprints specifying the structure of a person. They are better thought of as recipes for producing a person over many years. Because identical twins are created from the same recipe, their brains end up being fairly similar, though not identical, and these similar brains produce many of the same idiosyncratic behaviors. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, are made from two different recipes that happen to share half their instructions. Fraternal twins don't end up being 50% similar to each other. They end up with radically different brains and therefore radically different personalities, almost as different as people from unrelated families. Daphne and Barbara came to be known as the Giggle Twins. Both have sunny personalities and a habit of bursting into laughter in mid-sentence. They won the cortical lottery. Their brains were pre-configured to see good in the world. Other pairs of twins, however, were born to look on the dark side. In fact, happiness is one of the most highly heritable aspects of personality. Twin studies generally show that from 50% to 80% of all the variance among people in their average levels of happiness can be explained by differences in their genes rather than in their life experiences. Particular episodes of joy or depression, however, must usually be understood by looking at how life events interact with a person's emotional predisposition. A person's average or typical level of happiness is that person's affective style. Affect refers to the felt or experienced part of emotion. Your affective style reflects the everyday balance of power between your approach system and your withdrawal system, and this balance can be read right from your forehead. It has long been known from studies of brain waves that most people show an asymmetry, more activity either in the right frontal cortex or in the left frontal cortex. In the late 1980s, Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin discovered that these asymmetries correlated with a person's general tendencies to experience positive and negative emotions. People showing more of a certain kind of brain wave coming through the left side of the forehead reported feeling more happiness in their daily lives and less fear, anxiety, and shame than people exhibiting higher activity on the right side. Later research showed that these cortical lefties are less subject to depression and recover more quickly from negative experiences. The difference between cortical righties and lefties can be seen even in infants. Ten-month-old babies showing more activity on the right side are more likely to cry when separated briefly from their mothers. And this difference in infancy appears to reflect an aspect of personality that is stable for most people all the way through adulthood. Babies who show a lot more activity on the right side of the forehead become toddlers who are more anxious about novel situations. As teenagers, they are more likely to be fearful about dating and social activities. And finally, as adults, they are more likely to need psychotherapy to loosen up. Having lost out in the cortical lottery, they will struggle all their lives to weaken the grip of an overactive withdrawal system. Once, when a friend of mine with a negative affective style was bemoaning her life situation, someone suggested that a move to a different city would suit her well. No, she said, I can be unhappy anywhere. She might as well have quoted John Milton's paraphrase of Aurelius. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Scan your brain. Which set of statements is more true of you? Set A. 
I'm always willing to try something new if I think it will be fun. If I see a chance to get something I want, I move on it right away. When good things happen to me, it affects me strongly. I often act on the spur of the moment. Set B. I worry about making mistakes. Criticism or scolding hurts me quite a bit. I feel worried when I think I have done poorly at something important. I have many fears compared to my friends. People who endorse set A over set B have a more approach-oriented style and, on average, show greater cortical activity on the left side of the forehead. People who endorse set B have a more withdrawal-oriented style and, on average, show greater cortical activity on the right side. Scale adapted from Carver and White, 1994. Copyright 1994 by the American Psychological Association. Adapted with permission. How to change your mind. If I had an identical twin brother, he would probably dress badly. I have always hated shopping, and I can recognize only six colors by name. Several times I have resolved to improve my style and have even acceded to women's request to take me shopping, but it was no use. Each time I quickly returned to my familiar ways, which were stuck in the early 1980s. I couldn't just decide to change, to become something I'm not, by sheer force of will. Instead, I found a more roundabout way to change. I got married. Now I have a closet full of nice clothes, a few pairings that I have memorized as appropriate choices, and a style consultant who recommends variations. You can change your effective style too, but again, you can't do it by sheer force of will. You have to do something that will change your repertoire of available thoughts. Here are three of the best methods for doing so. Meditation, cognitive therapy, and Prozac. All three are effective because they work on the elephant. Meditation. Suppose you read about a pill that you could take once a day to reduce anxiety and increase your contentment. Would you take it? Suppose further that the pill has a great variety of side effects, all of them good, increased self-esteem, empathy, and trust. It even improves memory. Suppose, finally, that the pill is all natural and costs nothing. Now would you take it? The pill exists. It is meditation. It has been discovered by many religious traditions and was in use in India long before Buddha. But Buddhism brought it into mainstream Western culture. There are many kinds of meditation, but they all have in common a conscious attempt to focus attention in a non-analytical way. It sounds easy, sit still in most forms, and focus awareness only on your breathing, or on a word, or on an image, and let no other words, ideas, or images arise in consciousness. Meditation is, however, extraordinarily difficult at first, and confronting your repeated failures in the first weeks teaches the writer lessons in humility and patience. The goal of meditation is to change automatic thought processes, thereby taming the elephant. And the proof of taming is the breaking of attachments. My dog Andy has two main attachments, through which he interprets everything that happens in my house eating meat, and not being left alone. If my wife and I stand near the front door, he becomes anxious. If we pick up our keys, open the door, and say, be a good boy, his tail, head, and somehow even his hips droop pathetically toward the floor. But if we then say, Andy, come, he's electrified with joy and shoots past us through the doorway. Andy's fear of being left alone gives him many moments of anxiety throughout the day, a few hours of despair when he is left alone, and a few minutes of joy each time his solitude is relieved. Andy's pleasures and pains are determined by the choices my wife and I make. If bad is stronger than good, then Andy suffers more from separation than he benefits from reunion. Most people have many more attachments than Andy, but according to Buddhism, human psychology is similar to Andy's in many ways. Because Rachel wants to be respected, she lives in constant vigilance for signs of disrespect, and she aches for days after a possible violation. She may enjoy being treated with respect, but disrespect 
hurts more on average than respect feels good. Charles wants money and lives in a constant state of vigilance for chances to make it. He loses sleep over fines, losses, or transactions that he thinks did not get him the best possible deal. Once again, losses loom larger than gains. So even if Charles grows steadily wealthier, thoughts about money may on average give him more unhappiness than happiness. For Buddha, attachments are like a game of roulette in which someone else spins the wheel and the game is rigged. The more you play, the more you lose. The only way to win is to step away from the table. And the only way to step away, to make yourself not react to the ups and downs of life, is to meditate and tame the mind. Although you give up the pleasures of winning, you also give up the larger pains of losing. In Chapter 5, I'll question whether this is really a good trade-off for most people. For now, the important point is that Buddha made a psychological discovery that he and his followers embedded in a philosophy and a religion. They have been generous with it, teaching it to people of all faiths and of no faith. The discovery is that meditation tames and calms the elephant. Meditation done every day for several months can help you reduce substantially the frequency of fearful, negative, and grasping thoughts, thereby improving your effective style. As Buddha said, when a man knows the solitude of silence and feels the joy of quietness, he is then free from fear and sin. Cognitive Therapy Meditation is a characteristically Eastern solution to the problems of life. Even before Buddha, the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu had said that the road to wisdom runs through calm inaction, desireless waiting. Western approaches to problems more typically involve pulling out a toolbox and trying to fix what's broken. That was Lady Philosophy's approach with her many arguments and reframing techniques. The toolbox was thoroughly modernized in the 1960s by Aaron Beck. Beck, a psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania, had been trained in the Freudian approach in which the child is father to the man. Whatever ails you is caused by events in your childhood, and the only way to change yourself now is to dig through repressed memories, come up with a diagnosis, and work through your unresolved conflicts. For depressed patients, however, Beck found little evidence in the scientific literature or in his own clinical practice that this approach was working. The more space he gave them to run through their self-critical thoughts and memories of injustice, the worse they felt. But in the late 1960s, when Beck broke with standard practice and, like Lady Philosophy, questioned the legitimacy of his patients' irrational and self-critical thoughts, the patients often seemed to feel better. Beck took a chance. He mapped out the distorted thought processes characteristic of depressed people and trained his patients to catch and challenge these thoughts. Beck was scorned by his Freudian colleagues, who thought he was treating the symptoms of depression with band-aids while letting the disease rage underneath. But his courage and persistence paid off. He created cognitive therapy one of the most effective treatments available for depression, anxiety, and many other problems. As I suggested in the last chapter, we often use reasoning not to find the truth, but to invent arguments to support our deep and intuitive beliefs residing in the elephant. Depressed people are convinced in their hearts of three related beliefs, known as Beck's cognitive triad of depression. These are, I'm no good, my world is bleak, and my future is hopeless. A depressed person's mind is filled with automatic thoughts supporting these dysfunctional beliefs, particularly when things go wrong. The thought distortions were so similar across patients that Beck gave them names. Consider the depressed father whose daughter falls down and bangs her head while he is watching her. He instantly flagellates himself with these thoughts. I'm a terrible father. This is called personalization, or seeing the event as a referendum of the self rather than as a minor medical issue. Why do I always do such terrible things to my children? Overgeneralization combined with dichotomous, always, never thinking. Now she's going to have brain damage. Magnification. 
everyone will hate me. Arbitrary inference, or jumping to a conclusion without evidence. Depressed people are caught in a feedback loop in which distorted thoughts cause negative feelings, which then distort thinking further. Beck's discovery is that you can break the cycle by changing the thoughts. A big part of cognitive therapy is training clients to catch their thoughts, write them down, name the distortions, and then find alternative and more accurate ways of thinking. Over many weeks, the client's thoughts become more realistic. The feedback loop is broken, and the client's anxiety or depression abates. Cognitive therapy works because it teaches the writer how to train the elephant rather than how to defeat it directly in an argument. On the first day of therapy, the writer doesn't realize that the elephant is controlling him, that the elephant's fears are driving his conscious thoughts. Over time, the client learns to use a set of tools. These include challenging automatic thoughts and engaging in simple tasks, such as going out to buy a newspaper rather than staying in bed all day ruminating. These tasks are often assigned as homework to be done daily. The elephant learns best from daily practice. A weekly meeting with a therapist is not enough. With each reframing and with each simple task accomplished, the client receives a little reward, a little flash of relief or pleasure. And each flash of pleasure is like a peanut given to an elephant as a reinforcement for a new behavior. You can't win a tug of war with an angry or fearful elephant, but you can, by gradual shaping of the sort the behaviorists talk about, change your automatic thoughts and, in the process, your effective style. In fact, many therapists combine cognitive therapy with techniques borrowed directly from behaviorism to create what is now called cognitive behavioral therapy. Unlike Freud, Beck tested his theories in controlled experiments. People who underwent cognitive therapy for depression got measurably better. They got better faster than people who were put on a waiting list for therapy. And, at least in some studies, they got better faster than those who received other therapies. When cognitive therapy is done very well, it is as effective as drugs such as Prozac for the treatment of depression. And its enormous advantage over Prozac is that when cognitive therapy stops, the benefits usually continue because the elephant has been retrained. Prozac, in contrast, works only for as long as you take it. I don't mean to suggest that cognitive behavioral therapy is the only psychotherapy that works. Most forms of psychotherapy work to some degree, and in some studies they all seem to work equally well. It comes down to a question of fit. Some people respond better to one therapy than another, and some psychological disorders are more effectively treated by one therapy than another. If you have frequent automatic negative thoughts about yourself, your world, or your future, and if these thoughts contribute to chronic feelings of anxiety or despair, then you might find a good fit with cognitive behavioral therapy. Prozac Marcel Proust wrote that the only true voyage would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes. In the summer of 1996, I tried on a pair of new eyes when I took Paxil, a cousin of Prozac, for eight weeks. For the first few weeks, I had only side effects, some nausea, difficulty sleeping through the night, and a variety of physical sensations that I did not know my body could produce, including a feeling I can describe only by saying that my brain felt dry. But then one day in week five, the world changed color. I woke up one morning and no longer felt anxious about the heavy workload and uncertain prospects of an untenured professor. It was like magic. A set of changes I had wanted to make in myself for years, loosening up, lightening up, accepting my mistakes without dwelling on them, happened overnight. However, Paxil had one devastating side effect for me. It made it hard for me to recall facts and names, even those I knew well. I would greet my students and colleagues, reach for a name to put after hi, and be left with hi there. I decided that as a professor, I needed my memory more than I needed peace of mind. So I stopped taking Paxil. Five weeks later, my memory came back, 
along with my worries. What remained was a first-hand experience of wearing rose-colored glasses, of seeing the world with new eyes. Prozac was the first member of a class of drugs known as Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, or SSRIs. In what follows, I use Prozac to stand for the whole group, the psychological effects of which are nearly identical, and which includes Paxil, Zoloft, Selexa, Lexapro, and others. Many things are not known by Prozac and its cousins. Above all, how they work. The name of the drug class tells part of the story. Prozac gets into the synapses, the gaps between neurons. But it is selective in affecting only synapses that use serotonin as their neurotransmitter. Once in the synapses, Prozac inhibits the reuptake process. The normal process in which a neuron that has just released serotonin into the synapse then sucks it back up into itself to be released again at the next neural pulse. The net result is that a brain on Prozac has more serotonin in certain synapses, so those neurons fire more often. So far, Prozac sounds like cocaine, heroin, or any other drug that you might have learned is associated with a specific neurotransmitter. But the increase in serotonin happens within a day of taking Prozac, while the benefits don't appear for four to six weeks. Somehow, the neuron on the other side of the synapse is adapting to the new level of serotonin, and it is from that adaptation process that the benefits probably emerge. Or maybe neural adaptation has nothing to do with it. The other leading theory about Prozac is that it raises the level of a neural growth hormone in the hippocampus, a part of the brain crucial for learning and memory. People who have a negative affective style generally have higher levels of stress hormones in their blood. These hormones, in turn, tend to kill off or prune back some critical cells in the hippocampus, whose job, in part, is to shut off the very stressed response that is killing them. So people who have a negative affective style may often suffer minor neural damage to the hippocampus, but this can be repaired in four or five weeks after Prozac triggers the release of the neural growth hormone. Although we don't know how Prozac works, we do know that it works. It produces benefits above placebo, or no treatment control groups, on an astonishing variety of mental maladies, including depression, generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks, social phobia, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, some eating disorders, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Prozac is controversial for at least two reasons. First, it is a shortcut. In most studies, Prozac turns out to be just about as effective as cognitive therapy. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. But it's so much easier than therapy. No daily homework or difficult new skills. No weekly therapy appointment. If you believe in the Protestant work ethic and the maxim, no pain, no gain, then you might be disturbed by Prozac. Second, Prozac does more than just relieve symptoms. It sometimes changes personality. In listening to Prozac, Peter Kramer presents case studies of his patients whose long-standing depression or anxiety was cured by Prozac and whose personalities then bloomed. Greater self-confidence, greater resilience in the face of setbacks, and more joy all of which sometimes led to big changes in careers and relationships. These cases conform to an idealized medical narrative. Person suffers from lifelong disease. Medical breakthrough cures disease. Person released from shackles celebrates new freedom. Closing shot of person playing joyously with children fade to black. But Kramer also tells fascinating stories about people who were not ill who met no diagnostic category for a mental disorder, and who just had the sorts of neuroses and personality quirks that most people have to some degree. Fear of criticism, inability to be happy when not in a relationship, tendency to be too critical and over-controlling of spouse and children. Like all personality traits, these are hard to change, but they are what talk therapy is designed to address. Therapy can't usually change personality, but it can teach you ways of working around your problematic traits.
Yet when Kramer prescribed Prozac, the offending traits went away. Lifelong habits gone overnight. Five weeks after starting Prozac, whereas years of psychotherapy often had done nothing. This is why Kramer coined the term cosmetic psychopharmacology. For Prozac seemed to promise that psychiatrists could shape and perfect minds just as plastic surgeons shape and perfect bodies. Does that sound like progress or like Pandora's box? Before you answer that, answer this. Which of these two phrases rings truest to you? Be all that you can be, or this above all, to thine own self be true. Our culture endorses both. Relentless self-improvement as well as authenticity. But we often escape the contradiction by framing self-improvement as authenticity. Just as gaining an education means struggling for 12 to 20 years to develop one's intellectual potential, Character development ought to involve a lifelong struggle to develop one's moral potential. A nine-year-old child does not stay true to herself by keeping the mind and character of a nine-year-old. She works hard to reach her ideal self, pushed and chauffeured by her parents to endless after-school and weekend classes in piano, religion, art, and athletics. As long as change is gradual and a result of the child's hard work, the child is given the moral credit for the change, and that change is in the service of authenticity. But what if there were a pill that enhanced tennis skills, or a minor surgical technique for implanting piano virtuosity directly and permanently into the brain? Such a separation of self-improvement from authenticity would make many people recoil in horror. Horror fascinates me, particularly when there is no victim. I study moral reactions to harmless taboo violations such as consensual incest and private flag desecration. These things just feel wrong to most people, even when they can't explain why. I'll explain why in Chapter 9. My research indicates that a small set of innate moral intuitions guide and constrain the world's many moralities, and one of these intuitions is that the body is a temple housing a soul within. Even people who do not consciously believe in God or the soul are offended by or feel uncomfortable about someone who treats her body like a playground, its sole purpose to provide pleasure. A shy woman who gets a nose job, breast augmentation, 12 body piercings, and a prescription for elective Prozac would be as shocking to many people as a minister who remodels his church to look like an Ottoman harem. The transformation of the church might hurt others by causing several parishioners to die from apoplexy. It is hard, however, to find harm in the self-transformer beyond some vague notion that she is not being true to herself. But if this woman had previously been unhappy with her hypersensitive and overly inhibited personality, and if she had made little progress with psychotherapy, why exactly should she be true to a self she doesn't want? Why not change herself for the better? When I took Paxil, it changed my effective style for the better. It made me into something I was not, but had long wanted to be. A person who worries less, and who sees the world as being full of possibilities, not threats. Paxil improved the balance between my approach and withdrawal systems. And had there been no side effects, I would still be taking it today. I therefore question the widespread view that Prozac and other drugs in its class are over-prescribed. It's easy for those who did well in the cortical lottery to preach about the importance of hard work and the unnaturalness of chemical shortcuts. But for those who, through no fault of their own, ended up on the negative half of the effective style spectrum, Prozac is a way to compensate for the unfairness of the cortical lottery. Furthermore, it's easy for those who believe that the body is a temple to say that cosmetic psychopharmacology is a kind of sacrilege. Something is indeed lost when psychiatrists no longer listen to their patients as people, but rather as a car mechanic would listen to an engine, looking only for clues about which knob to adjust next. But if the hippocampal theory of Prozac is correct, many people really do need a mechanical adjustment. It's 
as though they had been driving for years with the emergency brake halfway engaged, and it might be worth a five-week experiment to see what happens to their lives when the brake is released. Framed in this way, Prozac for the worried well is no longer just cosmetic. It is more like giving contact lenses to a person with poor but functional eyesight who has learned ways of coping with her limitations. Far from being a betrayal of that person's true self, contact lenses can be a reasonable shortcut to proper functioning. The epigraphs that opened this chapter are true. Life is what we deem it, and our lives are the creations of our minds. But these claims are not helpful until augmented by a theory of the divided self, such as the rider and the elephant, and an understanding of negativity bias and effective style. Once you know why change is so hard, you can drop the brute force method and take a more psychologically sophisticated approach to self-improvement.